Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. We're so glad you could be with us today. The library obviously was closed last week for a very wonderful, successful writers' festival, and I don't know if any of you got to go, but you should in the future. Um, just a reminder to silence your cell phones, please. Um, my name is Sally Trademan, and I am the <clears throat> the chair of the Cultural Commission. And um, this afternoon's program is a second in this season's lineup of special events presented by the City of Santa Rancho Mirage Cultural Commission. Um, I have other people here in attendance today, uh, Kayla Pressman and our other uh, commissioners, Frank Farino and Donna Maloof. As we continue to celebrate 50 years of the Rancho Mirage, um, the, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> As we continue to celebrate 50 years of Rancho Mirage, the commission is proud to once again offer an exciting schedule of free, high quality programs to the community. Um, in attendance today is um, from the city council. I can't see too well, but uh, Michael O'Keefe, and I'm not sure if the mayor, Steve Downs, is here in the front. For all the details on upcoming programs, keep an eye on official communications from the library and city, and pick up an information card if you have not already. There are some in the back. And now for today's program. We are honored to welcome author and local historian, Melissa Ritchie, to lead us on an exploration of our city's growth. Melissa is the founder and president emeritus of Preservation Mirage, a nonprofit dedicated to the education and advocacy for the preservation of important architecture in Rancho Mirage. She has written about architecture for over 20 years in a variety of well-known publications and we can't imagine a better person to take us on this fascinating journey. Please welcome me in, well, please join me in welcoming Melissa Ritchie. Okay, make sure that everyone can hear me. Make sure I don't pop into the mic. Okay, thank you, Sally. Uh, thank you so much for all being here today. It's a pleasure to see so many of you. Um, just a show of hands, how many of you have seen me give talks before any place? Yeah, I was kind of afraid no one would show up because, you, you know, it's like, oh, her again, right? <laughs> um, so I do try and vary the content, but as we know, history repeats itself. So please bear with me if, uh, if you kind of heard some of this before. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I keep hoping that someone will invent a time machine, <clears throat> uh, at least a good way to travel through time and space, at least before I die. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen. In the meantime, we do have to rely on history and people like me digging through old media files to travel back in time. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to travel back about 100 years, in fact, to when Rancho Mirage was nothing more than bare desert and some optimistic ranchers. This slide is actually from the early 30s and it is of Rancho Mirage. Um, in the middle, kind of middle ground background, you'll see a dark line. That's a dark line of date palm trees. And this is kind of pretty much all that was here around then. Um, what happened next was there were a few early settlers. So this era from 1924 to 1950 is known by local historians and the people that did the city's survey as the agricultural era. And I'm gonna talk to you about some of that before we kind of move up to the present day. Um, the early settlers were uh, ranchers. They were uh, farmers, if you like. Um, the very first was Everett Duval, who started the Date Palm Ranch that became Wonder Palms. 
uh, then you had William Everett's 11 Mile Ranch, which was named uh, that way because it was 11 miles from Palm Springs. Um, but Davy in 1924, so 100 years ago, planted dates, he sold land, and he created Rio del Sol Road, which latterly became Bob Hope Drive. And we're going to see more of that um, as we go on. In 1932, the Follensby brothers built three homes from River Rock, and one stands in Rancho Mirage Civic Park today. If you've never been there, do go take a look. Um, it was for a long time uh, named after one of the Clancy's, but then one of the Follensby family, Stephen Follensby, um, realized that this house actually belonged to one of his ancestors, and I'm happy to say the city of Rancho Mirage and yours truly helped do some research that proved that this was in fact a Follensby home. There were three of these built out of River Rock. And then the last family that we kind of know because of the name of the street, the Clances, they also bought land from Bert Davy. They bought a 10-acre ranch off uh, Rio del Sol, and they, um, they put up several houses that were made of adobe brick. And um, I think the last of those lasted until about the 80s before it was pulled down. So why the name Rancho Mirage? I get asked this question probably more than actually any other question, and I'm sure there's lots of theories out there about it. Um, but the first um, real significance to the name was when a realtor called Lawrence McComber from Los Angeles <coughs> excuse me, bought Magnesia Falls Cove uh, land in 1935, and he's usually credited with the name. According to uh, local historian Tracy Conrad, who's also president of the Palm Springs Historical Society, Macomber's wife, Ruth, came up with the name of Rancho Mirage. And this was a quote that appeared in the Desert Sun from uh, Ruth uh, Macomber that Tracy had found. Puzzling what the name of this development should be and asked my advice, as far as the eye could see, the acreage was uninhabited I thought of the weary pioneers searching for water, searching for a rest spot and shade. So she suggested Rancho Mirage. She liked the image it conjured, and the gentleman readily agreed. Little did the three of us think of the growth the future would bring. Well, I have another theory. <laughs> So this is the great thing about history, because sometimes it repeats itself, and sometimes it's wrong, and sometimes we just don't know. So I'm going to give you a theory, and it's kind of fun. In 1934, a film came out called Lovebirds, and I just found this information a couple of months ago, so bear with me. Araminta Tootle, great name, played by Zazu Pitts, also a great name on the left, and Henry Whipple, are sold the same property by a phony real estate agent who later offers a bigger buyback price after hearing rumors of gold on the property. The rumors were planted by the get even buyers. So then I was kind of scrolling around the, the internet, as, as you do, and I found this article from April 1934, which was a review of the film Lovebirds, in the Oakland Tribune. And in it, it talks about the film's fictional location is El Rancho Mirage on the Great American Desert. The film came out a year before the Macombas bought the land. So I had a feeling that maybe Ruth Macomber had gone to see the film. Her husband had then gone and bought this land and she was sitting there and in the way you do, you, you know, things kind of enter into your subconscious, or maybe it wasn't her subconscious, and she just thought, oh, you know that, mm, hmm, thing, oh, Rancho Mirage, I like that name. And she remembered it from the film, or maybe subconsciously it had entered into um, her consciousness. Um, the Oakland Tribune, funnily enough, the following year, also paid a visit to the Palm Springs and Rancho Mirage area. And they described turning off the highway to see Palm Springs. It says, you know the place where all the movie stars go. Suddenly you reach a street which reminds you of an Algerian village or some other North African town. That's before you get a full view of the buildings, which are from Hollywoodish to modern, but on the whole, rather good. Very patronizing. 
Um, and then the article continues, and this is the piece on the left where it says date notes. Out on the desert, east of Palm Springs, where the wind whipped hard against the car, we discovered Rancho Mirage, something new under the sun. So they obviously saw a big promotional uh, real estate sign. We didn't see any Mirage or any Rancho, just desert. Sign said anyone could purchase chunks of the Rancho at $450 for one half acre. The Mirage is thrown in free. So in 1936, um, Macomber and Blankenhorn, his partner, decided to hire agents, Chapman and Cole, who created the tagline, a distinctive desert development for discriminating people, which of course we all still are, aren't we? So here you have um, a map of the early Rancho Mirage subdivision. And actually at the very top of this, I, you can probably just about make it out, it says something new under the sun, which was the tagline that Oakland Tribune had picked up on their 1935 visit. And on the right of that, um, that map, it says a community of atmosphere and charm where each home, regardless of cost, will be in keeping with the artistic plan of the community as a whole. So very, um, uh, very kind of thoughtful uh, planning. And when you look at this map, you kind of have visions of lots and lots of houses and lots of development and all this kind of stuff. Well, in fact, this is what, what it was. <laughs> um, I'm gonna use this kind of handy dandy um, Magnifying glass, see if it comes up. Okay, so um, moving down, top to, that's the Palm Springs to Indio Highway, now known as uh, Highway 111, of course. And then north to south here, that's Rio del Sol Road, which was just a track at that time. And then this area here is the Rancho Mirage subdivision. So this is from 1939, and um, there were, in fact, uh, by 1939, about six houses. <laughs> um, all lots are over a half acre in size, and purchasers of lots consisting of over an acre will have the privilege of keeping their horses on the property. The proper type of buildings is controlled by architectural restrictions. The thing was, in the 30s and all the way through the 40s and to the early 50s, um, horse riding was just huge out here in the desert. And it was, um, I kind of think of it as the tame west, not the wild west, because it was very much kind of organized with uh, riding stables and um, special I explorations to um, the high desert and that kind of thing. Um, so guides were furnished if desired. So talking of those six houses that were built in the subdivision, this is what they looked like. Um, Lewis Blankenhorn was Macomba's partner in the Rancho Mirage Enterprise. They'd sold six of these homes. And they were designed by Van Pelt and Lind, who um, were actually John Porter Clark and Albert Frey. Many of you, if you're architecture fans, will know there's an exhibition about Albert Frey currently on at the Architecture and Design Center in Palm Springs. I very much encourage you to visit it. Um, Albert Frey first came to the desert in the 1930s. He, he left for a few years, um, but he worked closely with John Porter Clark for a number of years before he came back and became extremely successful as a desert modernist. There, um, up until recently, there were at least two of these houses still left on uh, Sahara Road, in fact. I think one of them is still there, but one of them has been very, very heavily remodeled. And um, I'm not going to distress you by showing a picture of what it looks like now. Um, so Frank Morgan, who was known as the Wizard of Oz, he also built a house um, uh, in the Rancho Mirage subdivision. He wanted to be at a distance from uh, Palm Springs, and he was really into horses, as you can see on the right-hand side. That's Frank Morgan with um, a stable companion, I would guess you would call him. <laughs> 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 and um, on the left, that's him as the Wizard of Oz, clearly. 
Um, and that house is still there, I'm happy to say, and um, very historic. Um, so what else was going on with property buying out here? Well, a lot of people were buying ranches, and a lot of actors actually were buying ranches. So um, Frank Morgan's house was on a one-acre lot, I think. Um, but this article, which appeared in Limelight, which is a Palm Springs magazine from the time, um, talks about a number of well-known people who were building ranch homes, among them John Warburton, who was an English actor, and uh, next door to him was George Brent. And um, George Brent, who was also an actor, was planning to build a home and build an airport, bizarrely, um, while uh, his neighbor Jarvis Earl also had a ranch home. So this is um, dueling mustaches. George Brent, on the left, awfully dapper chap, um, made 11 films with Betty Davis, including Jezebel, and John Warburton appeared in numerous films from the 30s to the 70s, and later on in Star Trek TV show. So he, um, George Brent, I think, came and went fairly quickly, but John Warburton was around in the valley for quite a long time. And he and his uh, first wife, Lucille, took their ranching quite seriously and um, by this time they were experimenting with, uh, they were growing dates, neighbors were growing sugar beets and um, also grapefruits and uh, all of this was going on kind of across the wash from where the Rancho Mirage development was. John Warburton later remarried to Ruth Selwyn, who was an actress, and she was the first female theater producer on Broadway. And in 1942, they bought the 160-acre Red Roof Ranch from Philip Boyd, who was the first mayor of Palm Springs. Um, they got divorced, and uh, Ruth actually sold 80 acres of that ranch to Johnny Dawson and Frank Bogart, it was the extra land they needed to develop Thunderbird Country Club. So here we are. I'm just going to come back to this 1939 aerial because it kind of helps describe where the ranches are. And here's my handy dandy. Okay. So all of this area here that you see north of the wash were where all the ranches are. And you can see the whole houses kind of dotted amongst them. And again, remember, this was kind of just off of Bob Hope Drive. So these were mostly 10 acres or more. And then again, this was um, the subdivision of Rancho Mirage. Okay. Okay, we're moving, moving ahead, moving on in time to the 1940s. And I included these two pieces of artwork because I think they're so pretty. Um, but I also think they illustrate how passionate everybody was about horse riding and being a cowboy. And there was a lot of kind of playing at cowboys as well, which is why I call it the Tame West. Um, so in the, the Desert Circus was an annual event in Palm Springs. I wish it still went on. I think it'd be really fun to bring it back. Um, and at the top right-hand corner, you have a man on a bucking bronco. And then on the right-hand side, same kind of era, you have a cover of Palm Springs Villager magazine uh, showing men playing with horses in a corral. And just to, this has nothing to do, nothing to do with subdivisions. It's just to kind of keep you awake. Um, <laughs> um, and I just think it's so great because it's very politically incorrect. But it actually kind of, in some ways, speak, spoke to me, I guess why I included it, spoke to me about the transition that was occurring between the cowboy horse riding uh, phenomenon that the desert had been about all the way through the 40s and tourism and sitting by a pool and, and that kind of thing. Uh, this was an ad for a clothing store. Um, so agricultural ranches, as I mentioned, were very much the thing all the way through the 40s. Um, Paul Kirsten came from Germany in 1937. He bought 200 acres here in the desert kind of opposite where Thunderbird Country Club is, just off Country Club Drive. And by 1948, he had a packing plant there and was shipping Thompson seedless grapes across the country. Um, I've driven up Kirsten Drive, and I, 
if any of you are kind of curious, so don't don't go up there and sort of bus loads because it's a I, it's a public street, but you know obviously it's people don't want loads of invasive people going look at that. But <laughs> um, because I like to explore and I find these little tucked away corners of history in Rancho Mirage, if you go up kind of towards the end of Kirsten Road, you can see some old buildings and what I think was the original old packing plant and the original old ranch house are still there. And it's like going back in time, which as you can see is a fixation of mine. <laughs> Um, so this is acreage for sale, and this kind of really um, caught my eye because uh, down at the bottom it says farm to market road, and that farm to market road here is actually Frank Sinatra Drive because <laughs> that's a wonder date garden, and that's Deval Drive, and there's Cathedral City, and that's kind of the main highway. I don't know what the building project of 68 homes was. I think it was somebody's fantasy, <laughs> the real estate agents. Um, but he was selling 40, 80, 120 acres or the entire 160 acre lot. And the big advantage was there was 80 foot facing on the farm to market road. So um, what was going on in the 40s was that people were discovering this part of the desert, that it was a good getaway. So in addition to people like George Brent and John Warburton, who had discovered they could be uh, ranchers as well as actors, uh, this actor, Raymond Hatton, came and bought um, quite a lot of land opposite Wonder Palms State Garden, which is um, was on Frank Sinatra Drive, as we know it today. And... He commissioned Albert Frey, the same architect I was talking about, to design this uh, incredible, very Albert Frey-like modernist residence. And eventually, uh, the Hattons owned over 100 acres of desert land opposite Wonder Palms. Uh, sadly, this house was demolished, and I think it's now the, the whole area's Rancho Mirage um, Racket Club or Tennis Club. Um, it's the area of land on the right opposite uh, Tamaris Country Club. And this house is featured in the Albert Frey um, exhibition as well. 1946, uh, Desert Air Park and Hotel was opened by Hank Gogarty. He was a, a famous architect in um, Hollywood, actually, and he worked a lot with Howard Hughes, um, hence the sort of airplane connection. He had designed the airplane hangar for the Spruce Goose, um, and uh, he loved to fly. Uh, he also loved the desert, and he wanted to start a hotel. So in 1946, he bought a, a big section of the desert adjacent to the Rancho Mirage subdivision and created a hotel where people could fly in. Um, it, was, it says in the heading on the left, where air, airways meet and highways meet. Um, so it was a, a pretty spectacular place, and it was really popular for a really long time. Uh, this is Wonder Palms that I was talking about. Um, it started life as simply a date palm grove, a date palm farm, um, and eventually got taken over, and that too became a hotel and guest ranch. And then Thunderbird Ranch, which is probably the best known to all of you here, um, that was started by Frank Bogart and um, his, um, his first wife. And they bought 663 acres, which is a big holding. Um, they had been dreaming of this for about 17 years. And Frank Bogart was... Um, he came out the desert in 1929. He was originally a photographer and publicity person for El Mirador Hotel. And it was really his dream and his destiny, I think, to start a guest ranch that combined his passions, which were hotels and horses. Um, he had come out here with um, several dozen horses, and this ranch comprised um, accommodation for 45 guests, a swimming pool, and, of course, um, horse riding. Um, these are some rather wonderful pictures from 1947 magazine called Pictorial California, and I hope you can kind of make them out. Um, they're very um, redolent of Western um, 
decor. So you've got uh, rock fireplaces, the, the buildings themselves are made of adobe brick with uh, cedar-shaped roofs, and then all the furniture is leather, Mexican Surat blankets, um, you know, lamps made out of wagon wheels, you know, all that kind of thing. So really super charming. And of course, in the middle was the swimming pool because guest ranches by then, that was what they were all about. Um, so, yeah, Thunderbird Ranch started life in 1947 and, and was really successful for um, a couple of years. And we'll talk about that again in a minute. Um, but here you can see Frank Bogart at the left with, um, I guess, a Palomino horse. And um, a guy at the right kind of looks a bit like Frank Morgan again. I think he liked hanging out with horses and young women. <laughs> um, but it says they're, they're saddling up for an early morning ride over the thrilling trails in the nearby mountains. And it describes uh, Frank Bogart as a leader in horsemanship events for more than 20 years and well known as a rodeo announcer throughout the West, which I didn't actually know he did. So that was kind of fun to read about. And that, that was what the corral at Thunderbird Ranch looked like. So you can see um, very rustic in style and, and very Western, everything about it. A White Sun Guest Ranch, um, I get asked about this quite a bit. Um, it was formerly the 11 Mile Ranch that um, was started by William Everett. And it was opened in 1948. It became a really popular vacation spot for decades featuring horse riding, swimming, chuck wagon breakfasts, and, and fun for all the family. And um, it went through several transitions before it closed down, and then eventually it burned down in the 1990s. The last of the, the ranches that were being developed at this time, this was more of a kind of subdivision of homes behind Tamara's Country Club. Um, and there is a plaque on one of the homes um, there that says Flying H Ranch. This was developed by a guy from LA called Hiram Helm. And um, he started uh, subdividing areas of land. He also dug the wells. And um, these lots, there, I think there were still a couple of these old houses tucked away behind tall hedges um, behind Tamarisk, but not, not many of them. He carried on building houses there until the 60s. And then um, back off Rio del Sol, uh, we had Clancy Lane. Um, by then, it had taken the name of the Clancy's. And they, a lot of people there were still buying land during the early 40s and kind of play acting at being farmers. I mean, they call them gentlemen farmers. I think it's just kind of like, well, let's have a go and see what happens. And this article describes John Costello as going in for steers. So you can take from that the fact that he thought he'd raise a few cattle. But cattle don't do well on the desert, as you can imagine. So um, we're going to talk about Ronald Button. And he is one of the most influential people um, of his time, in the, certainly in the 40s and 50s, out here in Rancho Mirage. Um, there's actually a street named for Ronald Button. It's right next to Pink Elephant Car Wash. And it's still called Button Drive. Um, so hopefully it'll stay there because he was a really important person. He was, um, he is this chap with the glasses on the right in the lower picture, this guy. And then that's him over there with the eyebrows still <laughs> uh, on the right. Um, he was a Hollywood lawyer. He first came to the desert in the early 1930s as a representative for Prescott Stevens, who was the owner and builder of the El Mirador Hotel. So he would have probably come across Frank Bogart at that time. During the war, he spent several weeks recovering from pneumonia in a friend's house in Rancho Mirage and discovered there wasn't much around. In 1944, he started buying the Macomba land holdings. He discovered they were in fact beneficial interests in a company that Macomba and Blankenhorn had set up. His friend, Dave Culber, who's shown here on the left, helped him to buy a large part of the land, but Button wanted the whole lot. This was um, just as the war was ending. Citizens National Bank had the contracts for the beneficiaries. They were scattered all over the world, from the east coast of the US to Europe and Japan, and altogether the land holding was about 5,000 acres. 
Um, Button started out selling lots, but then realized that people weren't interested in buying lots when there was nothing else or no one else around. So he decided his best bet was to build homes and build them in sort of quantities of like 30 or 40 at a time. He ran into a bit of a problem, however, and this is where I'm going to need the help of the man at the desk. Um, so Button wanted to build um, this quantity of houses, but he went to Bank of America, and I can't click on this, I don't think, on my screen. So can you play the audio? told him that I decided that I was going to forget selling lots. I was going to build houses on them. And he said, well, I think you're absolutely right about that, Ron. Well, it, the reason I'm talking to you is that I want to get a loan for the houses, and I'd like to do 30 houses at a time, 30 or 40 at a time. Where did you say this was? And I said, well, it's... Uh, called Rancho Mirage, and it's halfway between Indio and Palm Springs, about 10 miles out of Palm Springs. And he started laughing, and he said, gee, I hate to tell you this, but he said, I can tell you something. You know, I've been here for years, and I know you represent the Elmira or Mr. Team, so you know the whole area, but I don't think you'll be surprised when I tell you there'll never be a loan made in the whole Coachella Valley outside of the city limits of Indio or outside of the city limits of Palm Springs. And he said, this has nothing to do with what you plan. It's just uh, never going to happen. What year was this? This was 1945 when I bought it. So that, that's um, an amazing piece of audio. I'm very happy to say that I found quite recently, thanks to actually an archivist at Palm Desert Historical Society, a bunch of interviews that were done in the 1980, early 1980s, I think actually 1980, and one of them was with Ronald Button. And so that's why I grabbed that audio from, that's actually him speaking in 1980, by which time he was a very elderly man. Um, but the good news is, for him, he was a very persistent man. He went to another bank. So, you know, moral of the story, don't give up. Um, <clears throat> so not with Bank of America, surprise, surprise. And he started to build. And he started um, building homes um, and advertising them. So this is 1946, after he'd been to been got his loan and um, he was advertising Rancho Mirage large lots, he was uh, um, advertising houses where worries fade and time stands still, live in the desert as nature made it. No crowding at Rancho Mirage. And here we are in 1948, moving right along, a pleasant motor trip of less than 15 minutes to Rancho Mirage opens new vistas of what living on the desert can really be away from the hustle and bustle of a crowded resort area. And he also realized that he needed to do some PR for this, and who can blame him, because there, wasn't, there still wasn't much there. Um, so Rancho Mirage is the only subdivision where residents do not have to call long distance in order to reach the stores and shops of Palm Springs. So, oh my gosh, can you imagine? 50 homes are occupied. So, I, I mean, I just, can you imagine? I can't imagine. Oh, we're all so spoiled these days. Um, so by January 1948, um, the full-page ads in the newspapers were offering a life that is healthful, restful, lazy. Many homes already built, more than 100 homes occupied and building far enough away, yet not too far. <laughs> And um, Button was very involved with AMVETS, uh, American vet vets, army veterans, obviously. And uh, so this was one scheme to try and sell lots, was win a home site for a $1 ticket. So that would be fun. So um, next up, the country club era. And I'm going to come back to Button in a minute, but I wanted to, we've moved up to 1951. I told you this was time travel, so I hope you're not getting G-forces. 
Um, Johnny Dawson, um, no one was more influential in the desert, really, than Johnny Dawson, um, not in Rancho Mirage, anyway. And if ever a man was responsible for golf in the desert, it was Dawson. I keep hoping that some organization or city will one day commission a statue of him, because like um, Tony Burke, who was a real estate man, Frank Bogart, who was also incredibly influential, and Ronald Button, and others who kick-started development here. Dawson was a man of vision, wide and far-reaching. After Thunderbird, he started El Dorado Country Club, and then when the condominium laws were passed in California in the mid-60s, he developed Seven Lakes Country Club and Marrakesh Country Club. So he shared the vision of creating golf courses with homes on fairways with others like Barney Hinkle, shown here at the left, and Frank Bogart on the right. And Johnny Dawson, um, along with several investors, bought the Thunderbird Ranch. And they bought some additional land, as I mentioned earlier, from um, Ruth Warburton. And they turned Thunderbird Ranch into Thunderbird Country Club. And here they, the three of these men are signing the deal that was to make that happen. Obviously, um, the influence was, was huge. They took William F. Cody, the architect, on board to help uh, plan the houses around the, uh, the uh, edges of the country club. And the concept of building homes on the fairways was born. The... Um, Homes were soon, the homes and the home sites at Thunderbird um, and subsequently at Tamaris Country Club the following year attracted the rich and famous and golf was really becoming a craze in the country. Famous LA architects and renowned desert architects like Cody were selected to design the custom homes at the two clubs. And um, the rest I'm actually going to fast forward because there's a book here for sale that I wrote five years ago. And if you haven't read it by now, you need to read it because the whole story of what happened with architecture and the country clubs is described in there. So I'm not going to repeat myself and, and bore you insane with the whole story of that because it's a long story, which is why it's a 250-page book. <laughs> Okay, so um, hopefully most of you are by now familiar with that history, but all kidding aside, it, it really is spelled out in the book. So what we have in 1951 on the left is the cover of Palm Springs Villager, that's Golf in the Sun at Thunderbird, and by March 1952 on the right, the Villager magazine is proclaiming the desert to be the winter golf capital of the USA. So that was just an, a year later. I'm going to talk a little bit about influences here. So um, Frank Bogart I've mentioned and Ronald Button and Johnny Dawson, but I wanted to talk about the other people on this list as well. Um, Frank Sinatra is on this list because the thing about the influences were that they were, they were people who promoted the area, either on purpose because, like Frank Bogart, Tony Burke, Ronald Button, they had... They were in real estate, or they were in uh, publicity, or they were—they had something that they needed to promote, to promote the area itself. In the case of Bob Hope and Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra, part of it was just by dint of them being here. So Sinatra moved here in, to Tamaris Country Club in 1954 and made it his primary home. And the fact that he moved to the valley at a time when his um, popularity was just rebounding like crazy um, obviously was a huge influence. Um, I'm going to talk about Tony Burke briefly because he doesn't get... A lot of you probably never even heard of him, but I come across his name all the time. And anyone who's a local historian here, and I know there are a couple of you, um, will know who Tony Burke is. He... He was a fantastic self-promoter. He moved to the desert in 1929. Um, he came from England originally. Can't get rid of us. And um, he, he moved out to the desert, and he, um, after he worked at El Mirador, he then started working, selling real estate with a guy called Raymond Cree, who was um, very well known in the desert too. And um, here he is with Albert Einstein, um, just kind of 
shooting the breeze, I guess. And here he is um, also with his um, cowboy hat on. So again, sort of dress up time. But he did dress like that pretty much all the time. And he sold land to everybody. He sold land to Bing Crosby for Blue Skies Village. He sold um, Thunderbird. He sold John Warburton his ranch. He sold uh, land at Thunderbird Country Club um, and sold land to lots of private individuals. So he, he had his finger in the whole pie here. Um, he used to create these fantastic maps, too. I've come across several of these. One of them even has a drawing of a UFO on it, which I couldn't, couldn't find in time for this talk, but it's worth, worth looking at. Um, so he had his office here in Rancho Mirage, um, almost opposite Blue Skies Village. I'm going to point that out to you here. There's Blue Skies Village, and there is oh, where Tony Burke's office is right there. Okay. And then up there's Tamarisk. And look, there was going to be a racetrack right on the corner of Bob Hope and Frank Sinatra. So that's now Rancho Mirage Country Club, I think. Desert Air Hotel um, and the Airstrip, White Sun Guest Ranch, Stables, and so on. So great maps, lots of fun. That was Tony Burke. Um, and then, obviously, Bing Crosby, he was one of the first celebrities to build a house, actually, at Thunderbird Heights. And he and Bob Hope, between them, were obviously golfing fanatics, and they brought, brought a lot of attention to golf. And Bob Hope, obviously, with um, eventually what became the Bob Hope Desert Classic. And Bing Crosby um, started Blue Skies Village, which is shown on the left, with a Rolls Royce. And I don't know how many owners still have Rolls Royces there. Okay, so the last person on that list of influences was Eisenhower. President Eisenhower came to the desert in February 1954. I gave a talk about this in Palm Springs during their um, Preservation Matters Conference in April. Um, <clears throat> and it's kind of an amazing story, and I'm only telling you a very tiny part of it, but this was the first visit of any U.S. president to the Palm Springs area, and he spent a week here. He stayed at a smoke tree ranch at the home of Paul Helms from Helms Bakery. And he had a very full uh, packed itinerary, really, um, which involved playing golf every single day, um, either at Tamrisk, which is shown here, or Thunderbird. And um, so he was nicknamed the golfer in chief, Eisenhower was. He played more golf than any president before or since. And he was the first president to install a putting green at the White House. And his visit here was reported by every media that you can possibly imagine. There was something like 150 media people in attendance. And um, his visit really helped fuel the media. Um, and that then, in turn, fueled the golf craze. So I, I put him high up on the list of influences. So here you are in 1959, no longer the golf capital of the USA, but actually the golf capital of the world. So we have moved on, and we are going to move on. So, okay, 1959, 20 years later, look what's changed. So here we go. I love aerial views, honestly. I, could, I get sucked into them like you wouldn't believe. Okay, let me just get this to work. Here we go. Okay, so this is the original Rancho Mirage subdivision that had only six homes on it 20 years earlier. That previous aerial view is 1939. Um, running through the valley is the road, main highway. Uh, that's the wash, obviously. And by 1959, we had this little uh, housing development. That was Tierra del Sol. That was in 1957. Some, a lot of the ranches are still there, as you can see. Down here is Desert Air Park. So that's a landing strip. And um, the hotel and the cottages and everything next to it. That is now where Omni Rancho Las Palmas is today. So good fun, and I hope you enjoy that. Um, 
the, all the aerial views can be found online. I'm, it's not like I have some private stash. They're, they're all there. <laughs> um, public, anyone who wants to find out more about them, um, ask me and I'll take your information. And if you're as um, nerdy about aerial views as I am, then you'll get hours of fun. <laughs> so... Okay, so 1950s, back to the Rancho Mirage subdivision. Um, it was still being built. So by, this, by the 1950s, they were full steam ahead, building houses like crazy. This was a community that was um, of about 40 houses called Sahara Terrace. It's, most of these houses are actually still there. They're about 1,300 square feet. Uh, one of our board members of Preservation Mirage owns one of these, is currently redoing it. Um, they are um, mostly along San Gorgonio and Mirage Roads up in uh, Magnesia Falls Cove. There were lots of different developers by now buying land from Ronald Button to put up lots and lots of houses. So by um, the mid-50s, all the advertising, because of the golf clubs, talked about being next door, and in this case, adjoining Thunderbird Golf and Country Club. You couldn't say that today. I mean, it's not adjoining. I'm sorry to be pedant pedantic about it, but there's no way that Magnesia Falls Cove is adjoining Thunderbird Country Club. Just saying. Okay. <laughs> A planned community for casual desert living on the Great American Desert. That uh, keeps coming back. The Great American Desert definitely pops its head up from the time it came up in the film, Lovebirds, on the Great American Desert. It comes up quite a lot in subsequent advertising. Uh, link letter homes. These were kind of Ronald Button's last hurrah because he actually became treasurer for the state of California in the late 50s. Um, so he moved up to Sacramento, but just before he did that, his brother-in-law was Art Linkletter, who I'm sure you all know. And um, Art Linkletter was a very enterprising guy, and he decided, okay, sure, I'll, I'll build a few houses. So he built about 40 of these um, rather beautiful homes, and I'm showing one on the right. Um, there's an illustration of one on the left. Um, yeah. So there's lots of those still there, and we had some of them open for a tour a couple of years ago. Um, what uh, Button did was he sold all his land holding to a Beverly Hills development company called Dessa and Garfield, who took the name Rancho Mirage Properties. And so from that point on, um, th that whole area uh, was very much Rancho Mirage. And by that time, they had built a, a shopping center. So where the... Um, Consignment stories and the row of shops. Um, what's the name of that consignment store? My mind's gone a blank. There used to be a Safeways and the row of shops next door to it. Um, that, that shopping centre and a post office were all in existence. So there was a real commercial centre right there. Cargo consignments, that's the one. I, everything, I remember everything by whether it's consignment store. <laughs> um, so 1960s, Chamber of Commerce, guess what? Casual desert living on the great American desert, live in the country club area. Rancho Mirage nestles in the sun-swept cove formed by the copper-hued mountains. Four beautiful golf courses nearby. I'm going to talk briefly about some of the stuff that didn't happen. <laughs> because, you know, we all know what's here, but what about the stuff that could have been here? So in 1962, this project was planned, a $150 million project with a skyscraper tower with a revolving restaurant and 500-room hotel on the corner of Country Club Drive and Bob Hope Drive. That's where it was going to be. And the developers were Owen Schumann, who uh, was the man who started the Riviera Hotel in Palm Springs, and his brother Mark, they actually subsequently owned, or they might have done then, owned the land that became the Springs. Um, so this whole um, plan was really, it was going to be uh, residential, it was going to be apartments, hotels, it was going to be entertainment, it's going to be a shopping centre, a bit like Coutinho, really. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that would get a laugh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Mayor Down. 
Um, okay, so Sky Mountain, that was another one that didn't happen. I think, just going back to Thunderbird Riviera East, um, I think the reason it didn't happen, that, uh, Kennedy was shot in 1963, and there was a recession, and I think a lot of things that were in the planning stages just kind of disappeared. Um, probably even Riverside County thought it was a bit over the top, so um, it, it obviously didn't get permission. Um, Sky Mountain, on the other hand, did get permission, and um, this was launched, actually, sorry, I've got the date wrong, 65, a hundred million dollar 10-year development launched. It was planned residential and commercial, it would have an 18-hole golf course, and um, <clears throat> that building that has the, um, the illustration of the building in the middle there, this here, Hold on to that image in your mind, because we're going to come back to that. Um, that was the information office for Sky Mountain. And these um, buildings here, actually on the right, they kind of were built, and I'm going to show you um, where in a minute. <clears throat> this was um, a crazy plan from an LA developer by the name of Merton Baker. Um, he had purchased a total of 2,560 mountain acres with elevations up to 3,000 feet in the area we now know as Mirage Cove. He created a temporary road up to 1,600 feet and he promoted the cooler temperatures. He employed uh, uh, architect William F. Cody to master plan a 640 acre section uh, with LA engineers mapping the section into 40 acre parcels, which he hoped to sell at 255 an acre. So what he did was he blew all the tops off the foothills. I wrote an article for this in the Desert Sun about mm, 10 years ago, actually, because I couldn't figure out why there were so many flat hills all the way along the road between City Hall and Thunderbird Country Club on the right-hand side as you drive uh, that, that way. And um, I came across this, and it kind of explained everything, because um, what he did was he, you know, put lots of dynamite in the ground and blew, blew the tops off all the hills. So you can imagine if you were playing golf at Thunderbird, you might have missed your shot <laughs> when that happened. Um, so yes, pretty explosive kind of thing to do, but pretty expensive thing to do as well. So this picture here shows you, oh my God, I mean, look what he did. The earthworks on this thing were just insane, unbelievable. Um, I'm gonna point out a few things to you here. Okay, so this is um, the road that goes up to Mirage Cove. So this is where Misty's Consignments is. See, I told you I think of everything in consignment stores. Um, this was a group of uh, houses that were built, the ones in the illustration. They're kind of townhouses. They're really beautiful, actually, still there, 60s. And then uh, two blocks uh, built right there. I think they're by Cody, but I can't prove it. It hasn't... I think Cody got so disenchanted with everything, he threw away all the drawings. This man was, he was a man who really liked to move earth. I mean, look at this. And talking about, you know, moving mountains, he was just, he was all over it. So, yeah, that was what he was up to. Um, and this is another view. And so that's Desert Braemar there. Um, Desert Braemar actually were made to move their entrance from there to there because it didn't suit this guy. And um, this is where City Hall kind of ended up. And so he flattened all these lots behind City Hall, what's now City Hall, kind of Mirado Estates, I guess. So all of this land, he blew up. And um, he didn't stop there because um, he offered free helicopter rides um, that was the way you previewed whatever your home site might be. Um, you could go up and see the, where the 18-hole championship mountaintop golf course was going to be and take a free helicopter ride. Um, no obligation, but adults only. Well, I'm happy about that. Guess what happened? It went bankrupt. I think it was all those free helicopter rides. <laughs> So that was Sky Mountain. Um, it did, you know, it kind of went, it, various people owned it. At one point, Walter Annenberg bought all the land. Um, 
and he realized after losing quite a lot of money on it he realized it was it was a non-starter um and so eventually it's kind of been built piecemeal but that's um that's what it was so remember that building that became city hall that building on the left was the first city hall for rancho mirage and that was the original information office for sky mountain so Unfortunately, it's not there today, but in the early 70s, or at least some point in the 70s, the city decided they liked it so much, they built a second one on the right um, with a lower tower. And then at some point, I think in the late 80s, um, because this is a Chamber of Commerce brochure that um, dates from about 1986, I think, um, at some point, uh, one or both burned down, and um, that was the end of them. Okay, so um, just moving into an era that's not even uh, registered in the city's survey, but I kind of feel like it should be called the condominium era. So what happened in um, 1964 is that the FHA passed laws that allowed um, multiple family housing, allowed people to get insurance and that kind of thing. Um, Palm Springs started to have uh, builders, developers come in and build condos quite quickly. Um, and people started to get a bit hot under the collar about how much building was going on. This article appeared in Palm Springs Life, and it says, the gravitation of thousands to new carefree living is eyed with a mixture of pleasure, skepticism, and downright foreboding. What are they like, the members of this new breed? Meet Mr. and Mrs. Condominium. <laughs> So um, people needed to kind of have the whole concept explained to them. And it, this article goes on to explain that it's not about sort of multi-story apartments. I guess it kind of thought about the New York model. Um, but it was nothing more than a style of ownership where, um, in the case of a residential project, the house and the immediate area around it are owned individually, while the general um, amenities and recreation facilities are owned in common. And that was really the key. Um, so in 1970, the first kind of big condo unit that appears in Rancho Mirage is uh, Thunderbird Villas, um, which was described as like a picturesque village in old Spain. Tile-roofed villas on a hillside looked down to one of the most famous golf courses in the world. And that didn't have a golf course, but this one did. So um, Mission Hills, was the ground was broken in 1969 for 1,200 condos. And uh, the, I think the land holding was almost 700 acres, possibly more, with pools and the clubhouse. And then, um, you know, they started selling the condominiums, nestled among the glens. I don't know why glens, but anyway. Um, <coughs> Full-grown specimen trees are several condominium villages. These homes have been planned to absorb the tastes and character of those who will live in them. And that really talk about marketing spiel. Anyway, um, Mission Hills, I'm sure you're all familiar with. It was uh, huge, it's still very successful. It had two golf courses, and that was really where the big country club developments kind of, they moved into that after Thunderbird and Tamarisk, you know, we had this hiatus, condominium law was passed. Th that made places like Mission Hills and Desert Island possible. Um, Desert Island at the bottom right, it says Palm Springs condominium living. Do what you like when you feel like doing it. <laughs> okay. Seven stories of lavish condominiums. So this had, was famous for having a Dennis Muirhead designed golf course. It sat on 25 acres in the middle of a 25-acre lagoon. And, um, you know, we're all familiar with it. I don't need to tell you that much about it. 1973, the springs actually didn't get completed till a couple of years later, but um, the ad was saying, a way of life worth waiting for. And I guess you had to wait a couple of years. Um, that was uh, 370 acres, and as I said, that was uh, uh, land that belonged to Owen Schumann once upon a time, and had also been date palm ranches. Sunrise Country Club, um, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this, but I am nearly at the end, don't worry. Um, William Bone was at the forefront of condo development in Palm Springs, and he developed Sunrise Country Club. 
he started building condos in Palm Springs, and actually a lot of people I read did get very upset with him. He, um, I hope he's not here, um, but you know, more power to him. Um, he was he had built Sunrise Alejos, um, a desert uh, deep well ranch estates. He'd built quite a lot of um, projects and. Um, after visiting Seven Lakes in Marrakesh, he realized that homeowners wanted a range of recreational activities, not just golf. He also realized that they wanted smaller and cheaper homes that they could lock up or, and leave or rent out. And so by the mid 70s, um, he was kind of making people nervous about the amount of building that was going on. And Palm Springs Life interviewed a lot of uh, local architects at the time, and a lot of them expressed these same kind of concerns. Um, this is Michael Black, who became quite famous. If the desert continues to grow at its present rate without the necessary restrictions, we will find ourselves in the very urban environment that used to be a desert. And this was back in the um, early 70s. But, you know, people carried on building. I mean, the cat was out of the bag. Condominiums were what people wanted. People wanted second homes. You know, there was, everyone had enough money. The, it was cheap to build them. It was cheap to sell them. That was the, the thing that William Bone really got right. And he, he started with Sunrise Country Club on that scale. But he went on to develop other country clubs around the valley and became hugely successful he really knew what he was doing which is why i do actually have a lot of respect for him um but you know places like thunderbird villas or this is los cocos which is um near frank sinatra and deval um they didn't have to have an 18 hole golf course they could just include pools and tennis and uh, pitch and putt course that kind of thing and so a lot of communities were built on that kind of scale with 72 in this case decidedly posh condominiums <laughs> so in 1974 and this is really how i kind of came up with the idea for this whole talk um the desert sun ran this ran this feature called rancho mirage is becoming country club city a vast majority of the city's area is devoted to country club development housing six of the valley's biggest and most elaborate country clubs, which of course were Thunderbird and Tamrisk, which they acknowledged was where it all started, um, Desert Island, um, Sunrise, Mission Hills, and the Springs, which was in development. And uh, late 70s, this is a, a rather spectacular view from now built Eisenhower um, Medical Center, looking towards the springs on the left and Desert Island on the right, with sunrise on the far left. And you can see how things have moved on apace. And of course, it didn't stop there. So in uh, the early 80s, uh, Morningside uh, Country Club started, and that was... Uh, a uh, $240 million uh, project um, with obviously, you know, beautiful houses, big clubhouse, that kind of thing. <coughs> um, tended to be more variety in the architecture, actually, at this point, too. And uh, Rancho Mirage Country Club, um, which is just about to celebrate its 40th anniversary. So that's how Rancho Mirage um, became Country Club City. I'm going to take you back in time, however... 1939, and um, just let you kind of sit and ponder about that and what the desert looked like, and think about, you know, what happens in the space of 50 years, and this is what happened 50 years later. So it kind of brings it into, um, you know, sharp reality, really, that we live in not an urban area, because we're still surrounded by mountains and desert, but it's just amazing to me how quickly, you know, I come from, as you figured out, I'm English, and, you know, things get done slowly over there, generally speaking. Um, so for me, 50 years is like, that's a, a second, split second in the history of the world. And yet in 50 years, that's how, how much things have got built. So this was the original subdivision down there. And then that is uh, Thunderbird Heights. Uh, that's kind of Mirage Cove where Sky Mountain, you can kind of see the earthworks still there, actually. Um, what else we got here? Thunderbirds in there somewhere. Um, that's 
Frank Sinatra Drive, north to south is Bob Hope. So, um, okay, what else have we got? Okay, last thing, a couple of plugs and then I'm done. Um, Mod Mirage, if you haven't got a copy and you want to find out about the 1950s, especially 1950s and 60s, growth of Rancho Mirage, books are for sale at the back. And then last but not least, I am, as uh, Sally said in the introduction, the founder of Preservation Mirage. I'm really proud of this organization. Um, I started it as a group of informal homeowners almost 10 years ago. Um, we now have a thousand members, uh, subscriber members. We have something like 250 paid members. Um, we offer a lot of education and programming, um, some advocacy work, uh, outreach work. We do tours during Modernism Week. We do house tours and, and other community tours. We help people research their homes. We do a lot of work in the background. We recently partnered with the city of Rancho Mirage on Saturday at the Pink Elephant, um, at the big Pink Elephant event at the amphitheater, which I hope some of you were at. Um, we um, were instrumental in getting the Pink Elephant sign designated historic, so it will be here for uh, future generations to enjoy. And I would really encourage you all to be members. Um, you can either scan this QR code, or you can go to the back and talk to Nathan, who is uh, on our board, and he will answer any questions you have. We also have some merchandise, hooray, <laughs> Nathan. Um, we have post pink elephant posters that were commissioned specially for this um, pink elephant event. And um, we have beautiful uh, trays that were done by a local designer that show two of the most historic homes, one at Thunderbird and one at Tamarisk. Um, and Nathan is there to give you lots of information about the organization. So with that, I thank you. <laughs>